I'm going to start. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share my presentation. Hopefully, it will be working OK. A key issue is right to repair is starting to be a topic that people understand about, that people are talking about. Um, we've been, as organizations working on the ground, we've been uh, working on this for a few years now, but it's starting to become one of those catch phrases. And part of this is excellent because it accelerates um, perceptions and potential opportunities for coming real reality but at the same time there is also a risk that with right to repair governments uh, uh, legislators the policy makers end up understanding something different from the real right to repair that campaigners have been um, fighting for for many years and i will talk about a little bit of this in the presentation so first i'll just introduce the european right to repair campaign um my name is ugo valauri from the restar project in london we are one of the co-founding members of a european right to repair campaign and the campaign starts from the perspective that there is a really high unsustainable environmental footprint of all the products that we use and that we keep buying and manufacturing and therefore, we need to change this and ensure that products can be used for longer uh, before becoming waste. And this has to do with the embedded energy uh, that they have and all of the materials and the energy impact that the materials have in order to mine them, assemble them, create the products, and then all the way to uh, shipping them to us. And the right to repair is a way for us, uh, people, citizens, uh, consumers, communities, to regain control over the things that we own and make sure that we can decide until when it is okay to use them and not be told that we can't use them any longer. The campaign uh, features uh, members of various kinds across uh, uh, most of Europe. Uh, we already have 89 member organizations in 18 European countries, and that includes community repair groups, sustainability activists, uh, academics, environmental NGOs, and uh, uh, other, uh, including uh, professional repairs uh, and um, companies increasingly interested in this as an important space, whether they supply spare parts um, or whether they're interested in the reuse economy as platforms, for example. And I'm presenting the campaign here because I think there might be some of you in the audience today and among the other speakers that might want to consider how uh, you might be able to contribute to the campaign in the future and how we might be able to bring together the issues that we are campaigning for with the issues related to free software as they're much uh, more closely interlinked than uh, we might think. So the key pillars of right to repair uh, until now have been uh, the importance of good design uh, so products that are possible to disassemble for repair and uh, products for which there is fair access to spare parts and repair information and uh, looking into the future, the importance of informing consumers so that people can make a uh, uh, good decision with all the information in available to them at the point of sale for when they're buying a new product and to know whether how that product is actually repairable or not or how long might uh, software support be guaranteed for that product for example um, things that are currently sorely missing uh, although there is a little bit of hope that in the future this might be a little bit better so this fits into a wider context of policies at European level, although the campaign also um, engages with uh, countries and national policy level uh, beyond the 
EU specifically, but there's the bulk of work that's happening in, in the EU. Um, there was a circular economy action plan approved last year and um, eco-design uh, repair requirements uh, um, that were approved in 2019 and finally came into effect. Uh, I'll mention them in more detail in, in March this year. And then there's a series of initiatives on empowering consumers for a green transition and uh, more work happening at future, on future regulations that might become into effect in the next uh, two, three years. And the big milestone for, for all of us has been uh, this new regulations on energy uh, uh, labeling and eco-design that have uh, been approved in 2019 and that finally came into effect uh, this year in March across Europe uh, so that for a range of products, and we're talking about not the most obvious products that we normally think about when we think about uh, the free software movement, but this we had to start somewhere. Um, TVs, fridges and, and uh, uh, freezers, washing machines, uh, dishwashers, but servers as well. And for the first time, there are uh, some repair re related re requirements for some of them. And these uh, requirements uh, are uh, that there, for the first time, um, there is a series of key parts that uh, need to be made available and need to be available when taking apart the product. So improving the design so that it's easier to repair them. And these parts need to be available in legislation for seven to 10 years after a product is uh, removed from the market. So this starts giving people a better understanding of what is the projected lifetime of products, not just when a product is stopped being sold, but actually there is an afterlife, which I think is particularly important from the context of pushing for uh, free software in the future. Then there's other aspects uh, on making repair information available and with some caveats, unfortunately, that uh, for the first two years of, since the product is put on the market, uh, manufacturers wouldn't be required, uh, they could choose to do this, but they, they wouldn't be required to make the information nor the spare parts available uh, widely on the market. But there, there are still a lot of important barriers um, in, in this legislation, and uh, some of that is obviously it only applies to a certain number of products and um, there is a big distinction between the amount of information and spare parts that will be available to everyone as opposed to those made available to professional repairs. There's a bit of potential uh, conflict on the definition of who is a professional repairer which could leave up to manufacturers the opportunity to limit um, provision of parts to some professional repairs closer to their um, official uh, networks, but not necessarily as, uh, as much to all professional independent repairs. And like key aspects, so you'll see them in this last six, seven and eight points but these are really the key aspects that are the heart of our future campaigning is that this legislation come from a perspective of eco-design. So um, on limiting energy consumption uh, in use uh, or energy consumption in manufacturing increasing. And so because of that, pricing uh, was not really a criteria, but it, it's obvious to everyone that pricing needs to be a criteria taken in consideration for, for all of this to happen. Otherwise, people uh, might not find it particularly attractive or convenient or even possible financially to um, keep repairing things if it costs too much. And crucially, um, the pricing is kept uh, virtually high, uh, artificially high by binding some key parts of this spare parts together so that even if you have a fault on a small spare part, occasionally it might, that part might be sold packaged together with other parts, which really limit um, 
what increases artificially the price. And uh, software remains uh, virtually unaddressed, and I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, shortly on this. So what, what needs to happen? Um, we need more product groups to be taken in consideration. Uh, there's, when people talk about right to repair, people think about a much a wider range of products. It's not that you only care about uh, your washing machine uh, being repairable, but you want your laptop being repairable, your coffee maker being repairable, your uh, wearable products to be repairable, your smartwatch and, and so forth. And we need more inclusive repair markets so that uh, whether it's a firmware update, whether it's a spare part, or a piece of repair information on the schematics of a product, uh, they should be made available to everyone universally and not just to professional repairers, which is a, a useful start, but it might drastically limit the range of impact, environmental and otherwise, that we can make with all of this. And also, we campaign for a European-wide uh, repair index that uh, might make it easier for people to understand when they're buying products, uh, what it is that they're buying, and whether that product, there are some trade-offs with regards to length of software update support provided or otherwise. But indeed, the big elephant in the room, and you're probably wondering, well, why are you telling us about uh, all of this about spare parts and repair information? And the real topic of this talk is software. I've kept it a bit frustratingly as such, because the truth is that software has been neglected, uh, drastically neglected until now, when it comes to uh, right to repair. And uh, uh, there's various ways in which this has happened. And there's also some misunderstandings um, about uh, what has been already included in the current regulations on this initial product categories. And I'll go now a bit more into that. But also, there is some rays, there are some rays of hope. So uh, don't, don't, don't lose hope <laughs> halfway through. So existing regulations um, only require manufacturers to make available the most recent software update uh, up until the end of the product support. So what, what this means is that, let's say you are a manufacturer of a product and uh, you release a product, and like a connected product that has an underlying piece of software uh, embedded within it. And you realize a month later that that product needed one update. Um, because uh, there was a bug or a security threat. Currently, once you publish that first update, as long as you make that update available for uh, seven to 10 years, depending on the product categories, until the end of the projected support period, you will be complying with the regulation. So. This regulation does not require manufacturers to keep supporting products with additional updates to the software, to the security packages uh, for, for long at all. And there's been uh, some um, yeah, misunderstandings in the wider community thinking that actually this was a good start, but it's actually quite meager and uh, seems a very light touch way of saying that if you are a professional repairer and for whatever reason you have to reset a product and then you'll be still able to access the support patch released maybe <laughs> five or six years earlier but that doesn't mean that the product will continue to be supported unfortunately but um there is there are some useful opportunities coming up um we are currently in a series of rounds of feedbacks uh on a draft regulation for uh eco design uh for smartphones and tablets and uh we expect this to uh be approved in the next year by 2022 um notwithstanding um, a lot of uh, tensions between different 
agendas of manufacturers and the organizations that represent them and uh, uh, environmental organizations and campaigners such as ourselves. Why is this interesting? Because for the first time, actually, software is mentioned more prominently and uh, um, there, we, there is an understanding that bringing minimum support for a number of years for software and security updates is necessary in order to reduce unnecessary fast uh, recycling and uh, uh, upgrading cycles uh, across Europe. And this is, could be game changing also because such regulations approved in Europe could really change the future of uh, how manufacturers start thinking about this for other countries as well beyond uh, Europe. I left it at X because currently this is still in negotiations. Uh, we are hoping to see a five years uh, support at least for software and security updates, uh, but we would love to see a lot more than that. And why so, specifically smartphones? Um, this is uh, a picture from <laughs> a model that was very popular a few years back, but I chose this one because unfortunately it's not changed the proportion of how much of the environmental impact of a device like a smartphone occurs before you've ever switched it on is staggering. It's approximately 80% for the vast majority of models. So that means that that very first time you switch it on um, and you do your first software updates, well, the vast majority of its environmental impact has already occurred. So the only way we have to increase uh, the efficiency and reduce our footprint on the planet is to keep these products in use for as long as we possibly can, which unfortunately often is a, a long more than the manufacturers themselves are prepared to support them. So as part of our um, work as a campaign, we've launched a provocation um, with a uh, a European right to repair campaign in, in with a 10 year phone uh, campaign, which you can still visit. And uh, that looks at some key criteria. Um, and one of them is, well, if phones need to last 10 years, then we need 10 years of software and security updates. Uh, why not? Why has does it have to seem like too much to support a phone for 10 years. It, it's just been so ingrained in our uh, lives that smartphones are products that we keep upgrading every other year, that even the thought of thinking that 10 years support, um, many people have even questioned whether we understand uh, that technology does change and improves. But um, critiques of such campaigns don't necessarily understand that the full lifetime of a product is not necessarily just um, in the hands of people that are very technology savvy and might need for whatever reason to upgrade for specific extra functionalities. But there's a secondary market and a tertiary market and people can continue to benefit from these products, particularly if security and software are kept uh, up to date. The biggest problem that we see, and uh, I'd love to hear from you, how can uh, free software could help, is that of part pairing. Now, part pairing, some of you have probably heard of this, maybe called uh, serialization. Um, and it has to do with how uh, manufacturers, some more um, uh, upfront than others, are more and more considering using uh, pairing uh, at software level of a device with specific spare parts so that even if you are um, able to disassemble a product and replace one part that part might lose functionality uh, some or completely unless the manufacturer repairs it uh, using the serial number of that specific part that makes it uh, working again. This is huge because it could kill any uh, independent repair industry. 
uh, destroy jobs of independent repairs and prevent anyone from doing any DIY repairs. Uh, we are fighting against this, um, asking the EU to not make it, uh, uh, to not make it, to not allow manufacturers to include this in future regulations but there is a lot of pushback and uh, we we're far from seeing um, a positive ending on this so free software uh, sadly it's currently absent from any of the regulations so when we campaign for a 10-year phone uh, we don't necessarily expect manufacturers to provide 10 years worth of software updates. Software could be, free software could be the solution. We could be requiring as the Free Software uh, Foundation Europe is uh, campaigning about um, for software to become, um, to be released in, in free uh, and uh, libre format uh, when a manufacturer stops supporting the product. Um, other options could be that users should always have all the freedom to uninstall and replace the software that come with that product with software that they're enabled to compile themselves or to access from source, trusted sources that can extend the life of products. Of course, there have been plenty of cases of this in the smartphone world, but the fact that some of these options do exist isn't enough because they are widely out of touch for, for the vast majority of consumers, like the vast majority of people that we see at community repair events and not even mentioning them, like people at large are not able to really do this, uh, this software, uh, this move to uh, free and open source software completely. It's still complicated, artificially so, because of all the barriers that manufacturers are putting. So we see a real opportunity to change this, but in legislative terms, this is still extremely weak and we don't see enough uh, awareness for policymakers to, to, um, to do this. So we see an opportunity to combine the campaigning on from organizations that work on digital rights, uh, those such as the Free Software Foundation Europe that are working on uh, pushing for more access to free software and campaigns such as the European Right to Repair campaign to bring together an agenda that doesn't necessarily create um, um, a friction between providing longer term support for all products with software and security updates, but at the same time, creating an opportunity for more freedom for everyone to use the software they want. So that, you know, if we talk about a 10 year phone, well, maybe for seven years, manufacturers could support it directly, but they should not create barriers from earlier on for uh, extending that support further. Anyway, I think this is uh, an introduction to this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, your questions, your challenges, and I hope we can be a beginning of a joint pathway towards reaching that goal together with all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, these are our contacts, and I'll be happy to discuss and take your questions. I would be in particular also since you mentioned it uh, interested in what do you think like what would from from the repairability factor of devices what would be more beneficial having an extended support like five years seven years ten years of uh, of an obligation of supporting a device with uh, software updates or that, for example, a manufacturer can decide after two years or three saying, okay, there's no, let's say, economic benefit anymore in the device, I stop the support, but I uh, give, like, I, I publish the source code under a free and open source software license. So what do you think would be from more practical for repairers? 
It's it's a really good question, and I think we are concerned that um, allowing manufacturers to, in a sense, wash their hands after two years and just say, "Oh, here you go, here you have your uh, uh, source code," uh, might not necessarily benefit the vast majority of users that will still like to continue use their device, but might experience some barriers when it comes to moving from um, um, a, an open source um, alternative operating system for the product, if that's what you're hinting at, because it could work in other ways, but it it, it would be important to understand um, if uh, provision, for example, of software and security updates to an existing um, version of an operating system as it was uh, provided by the manufacturer could happen with a trusted um, independent uh, provider that would take over support without requiring to everyone to change completely operating system in order to, to get there. So that's why our campaign has focused uh, on extending the requirements for manufacturers as a first step because we don't want uh, the benefits of additional uh, reparability or like uh, continuing to, to expand the durability of a product um, to be reserved to those that might have the skills to install um, an alternative operating system using uh, some of the source code that was released. But the choose, again, I, I think that the, the key aspect is avoiding a situation where these movements that ultimately want to empower users to keep uh, ownership of the products that they buy for much longer than they are allowed to today, uh, it's really crucial that these movements work together and find a good synthesis that kind of satisfies both uh, agendas and not aren't seen as like a contradiction. Uh, so um, kind of allowing manufacturers to sort of uh, do as little as possible or their job and, and then moving on. Because the key aspect is that they for many years, they've been very keen to keep releasing more and more products uh, at all times and not so keen on supporting the products that they are already uh, putting on the market for long enough. And that, and that is what really needs to change. Thank you. I also think that uh, we can combine the two demands easily. And I also have a question for you from someone from our online audience that I would like to share. It's Julio Roman who asks, do you think it would be possible to stimulate the adoption of repairable products by easing the import of products manufactured outside the EU? For example, lowering taxes. It's, I wonder um, what, what's the, whether you see products that are more repairable uh, being harder to access because of taxation at the moment. Um, what we are seeing, and you know, it would be interesting to see where, where that comment comes from. Um, and if you'd like to follow up uh, further, I'd love to hear more. Uh, what, what we're seeing is the regulations at the moment, um, the eco design regulations, are set up to prevent uh, manufacturers that don't respect minimum standards from flooding the market with products that might be um, either not energy efficient or uh, not repairable. Um, and so that sets like minimum basic criteria to, to avoid that. Um, I would be surprised that there's some products that are very highly repairable, but currently hard to um, bring to the market because of existing taxation, but I'd love to learn to learn more. I think what we need to do is increasing the level of consumer information, uh, particularly through um, uh, an EU-wide um, ambitious approach to a repair index score. Some of you might be familiar with the work that's happened in France, where an initial um, 
uh, repair score index has come to fruition for some product categories and uh, for the first time it scores products such as washing machines smartphones lawnmowers and uh, televisions and a few others um, in terms of their repairability giving a score between one and ten and the price of the key spare components um, is included as well as the price of well as well as some points about uh, software support however um, this doesn't sufficiently in our view uh, make it transparent for anyone to check what are the underlying statements statements that manufacturers are making and it also doesn't sufficiently differentiate between products that are extremely repaired and actually uh, supported for long uh, software-wide and those that might be only partially repairable. So it's a good first step, but it needs to be followed up uh, at European level by um, a better standard uh, that actually focuses a lot more on the affordability okay. of repair as well as on long-term software support. And having access to free software should be given uh, a lot extra points to any product because it might lead to um, strong communities that can support them well beyond the intended duration.